with you. I have some special guests this morning from Wichita. Uh, not many preachers have fan clubs that follow them around, but <laughs> <clears throat> I'm, I'm sure it has nothing to do with the fact that their son lives in the neighborhood, but uh, glad to have the Dops family here from Wichita. We've been working a uh, couple of weeks that I've been here on a series called The Journey, actually The Christian's Journey. Uh, we've been talking about the progress that a Christian should make uh, as they go through the Christian life. Uh, we started with the topic of moving from death to life. Moving from death to life and the fact that we are either dead or sin or we're alive in Christ. The Bible speaks very clearly about that and we talked about that's how we need to start the journey of being a Christian is to move from that condition of being dead in sin to becoming alive in Christ and we talked about how to do that. Last week we moved on to talking about moving from worldliness to holiness. Uh, most people we said don't think about being holy. If you ask them are you holy they wouldn't admit it. Uh, but after we talked about it, hopefully we understand that a little bit better. It's not the concept of being sinless, no one's sinless. It's not a fact of withdrawing completely from the world. Uh, and it's not just keeping a list of do's and don'ts that make you holy. Uh, we talked about the fact that holiness is being set apart, uh, being separate for God, being more and more godlike as we grow more and more holy. And the fact that it's a pursuit, it's not anything we ever achieve and say, okay, I've got it. Uh, something that we keep working on throughout our life. Uh, so that's where we've been. Today we're going to talk about a topic of moving from being served to serving. Um, and if you're here visiting and expected a Mother's Day sermon, I sort of apologize. Uh, this first year in a long, long time, I haven't talked about mothers specifically and tried to honor them in some way. Uh, but since I'm only here five Sundays and we've got this topic I want to get covered, I've got to stay on task. Uh, so we're not going to talk specifically about mothers. But on the other hand, uh, if there's any other topic that fits mothers, uh, this is probably it. Uh, the idea of service. Uh, the idea of not being served, but serving. That's a pretty good definition of mothers, I think. Uh, so you can apply almost everything that we talk about today to, to motherhood, and some of you probably will as we go along. Um, some of you are old enough to remember going to gas stations and having to decide which island to pull into. Uh, the sign said full serve or self-serve. And most of you don't remember that, but some of you are old enough to remember that. Uh, I think that probably started about in the 70s with the gas crisis and all that. Uh, before that, it was full serve. And not, mar not very many of you remember before that when it really was full service. And for you youngsters, let me just educate you a little bit here. The old guy will give you some history. Uh, when you used to pull into a service station, there was a black cord at the driveway that you ran over and it would make a ding inside. And when it dinged inside, the people would come out of the gas station. Sometimes one, sometimes two, sometimes three, uh, depending on how busy they were and how many were on duty right then. And they would have on a uniform, like these guys in this picture, in their pocket they'd have a pin and a tire gauge and be ready to go to work. And they'd come out and ask you if you wanted them to fill it up, and they'd ask you whether you wanted regular or ethyl. Uh, and I know this is strange language to you folks, but th th they, they did that. And then they'd go to work on the car once they get the gas pumping. Uh, they'd open the hood. They'd check the oil. They'd wash the windows. They'd check the tires, air them up if they needed some air. Uh, they might even vacuum the car out a little bit for you. That was called full service. Actually, back then, it was just normal service. Uh, now, you pull into a gas station, and there's no human in sight. Uh, you got to go, go somewhere to find one, and heaven help you if you need an air pump these days. You can't find one. It's not 
full service. Well, I tell you about the old style of gas stations, the old style of full service, because I want you to understand that some people come to church like that. Some folks come to church and expect full service. They want the seat to be comfortable. They want the temperature to be kept just about in their comfort zone. They, they want the sermon to be entertaining and interesting and maybe have a little Bible in it and not go too long. They expect their favorite hymns to be sung. They expect their children to have a nice classroom and be taught well. They expect their children to be kept safe and entertained and They'd like a pretty place for weddings in case somebody in the family ever gets married. They'd like a church to provide activities that they enjoy, things that fit them. That's how some folks go to church. Now, understand now, that's okay. I'm not slamming those people. In fact, the people here at Castle Rock want Castle Rock Church of Christ to be a place to be served. We know that people come expecting full service. So the folks here try to provide that. They're parking place for visitors out there. You don't have to walk very far. You can pull right up the front door. They, They want to serve folks here. Uh, do all sorts of things to try to serve folks. We don't ask any visitors to stand up and embarrass you or anything like that. We provide a card that you can fill out if you need anything. It ask you, do you want this? You want this? We'll, we'll try to provide it for you. We try to serve. Uh, church, churches do all kinds of things. Like back home, we've got a guest lunch that we have every Sunday except holidays, and we invite all the guests to stay. And we've divided up the congregation into eight groups, and each group takes a Sunday, and they bring enough food for them and all the guests that stay, and uh, we try to serve people. And lots of guests like that. They get a free lunch and a good lunch and and get out quicker than they could ever go to any restaurant and all that, so we, we try to provide that. Now, if you come to guest lunch for two or three months in a row, we're going to have a talk with you. Yeah, but <laughs> it goes beyond that a little bit. But the point is, it's okay. We, we want to be a church that serves. And it's okay to shop around. We know people in the world do that. Religious folks looking for a church, they want somewhere that serves them, that fits their needs. And we like that. But part of a Christian's journey involves a transformation to where they begin to think of this place as not just a place to be served, but a place to serve. That's the part of the journey that we want to talk about this morning. At some point, Christians ought to move from serve us to service. That's the transformation we want to talk about. Begin to move from being served to serving. Begin to see this family as a place where we serve others. And I know some of you are sitting there thinking, "Ah, I know where he's going. He just wants people to do things. They need some workers in this ministry or that ministry, and he's going to try to talk people into into ministering and working and doing things and all that. And no, I'm not. This isn't about recruiting help. In fact, I had a thought. You know, if you could outsource everything that needs done at a church, you know, have pagans do all of it. (laughs) Where nobody had to do anything. That would be the worst thing in the world. This isn't about needing help, wanting help, trying to recruit. I don't even know what kind of help they need here in Castle Rock. This is about you growing up. 
This is about you on the journey as a Christian. Moving from death to life and then from worldliness to holiness and then thinking about, I, I need to serve others. Making that transformation. Let me help, try to help you understand why I'm talking about this. Look at what Paul thought in 1 Corinthians 4.1. Now let's understand this first of all. Paul was under attack. Paul had a bunch of teachers that had come to Corinth after he had been there and began telling people he thinks he's such a big shot he claims to be an apostle he claims this all of that you don't need to listen to him and what Paul said was let men consider us me and my co-workers just let them consider us as servants of Christ if you paraphrase the whole context there, he, he's saying when the time comes to render a judgment about me and my coworkers, I know these guys are saying these things about me, but when it comes time to render a judgment and God looks at us and says what we're like, I want him to just call us servants. I want to just be known as a servant. And that's not real startling until you think about who was writing it. You understand what Paul could have said? He could have said, I'd like people to think of me as the best preacher ever. I'd like people to think of me as the guy that started the most churches in the history of the world. I'd like them to think of me as the best missionary that ever missioned. I'd like them to think of me as maybe the guy responsible for the most baptisms in the widest area of my time in life. I'm the guy that wrote the most books in the New Testament. Remember that. But probably the best theologian of all times. In my opinion, probably the greatest Christian that ever lived. But he didn't say any of those things. He said, when it comes time to think about me, to understand who I am, just call me a servant. Just call me a servant. Now, you've got that in your head, hopefully, and you're almost ready to understand what Paul was talking about. You hadn't completely got it yet. So it's time for a little naval history here. Okay, this is a warship back in the days of Paul. It's a trireme. Uh, had three levels of rowers is where that term comes from. Uh, these were built to be fast, and they were built to ram other ships. That's how they fought. Okay, they didn't have cannons and stuff back then, so they'd get this baby going as fast as they could and ram the other guys and then take them over. Okay, the crew of these ships, these triremes, there were about 200 men on one of these triremes, and the crew consisted of some spearmen and some archers. There were only about 12 of those. Didn't need too many. Their job was to keep anybody from getting on board. Another ship got close and they tried to board you. These guys would shoot them. There was a captain over everything. There was a helmsman who navigated the rubber, rudder and made the boat go where it was supposed to go. A lookout was up at the top and he was kind of the navigator. He'd tell the helmsman what to do and when. There was an administrator on board who paid the sailors and got arranged for food and all of that. There were about 25 sailors that took care of the rigging, the sails and getting them up and down and all of that. <clears throat> so that was the staff on there, but if you've thought ahead a little bit, uh, something had to make this boat move. And that was the rowers. There were about 170 of them. And they were lined up on three rows. The top level was up on deck where they could have the sunshine and the ocean breeze and watch what was going on and probably other than sunburn, it was pretty good duty up there. Uh, the mid-level guys were down under them a little bit where uh, there wasn't quite as good of air down there and wasn't quite as good a view and you could see a little open sky maybe. And then the third level was down in the belly of the ship, down below the deck, down at water level. In fact, boats in those days had a little water in them usually, so they were probably ankle deep or knee deep in water most of the time. 
and it wasn't very pleasant down in the below decks where they stored everything and if they had any uh, things going bad they were down there this is where those guys were no air circulation pretty rank down there probably okay that's how a trireme worked now you got that history lesson because of this when Paul wrote that verse and said let people consider me a servant he had a lot of different ways he could use a word he had a lot of different Greek words he could have picked he could have picked a word for servant meant minister one that meant deacon one that meant slave, one that meant bond slave, one that meant house servant. Those are all servants. But when he wrote that, he wrote the Greek word huperites, which means under rower. The bottom level rower on a trireme. That's the exact word he picked out. And when you think of me, the greatest missionary said when you think of me the guy that wrote most of the New Testament when you think of me you think of an under rower I'm just a guy down in the belly of the ship doing my job manning my oar doing what I'm supposed to do Now, I'm not much on Greek. I don't study it. I don't know it all. That. But when I heard that the first time, I think I read it in a book somewhere, the light bulb went on. I said, if that's what the Apostle Paul thought, then I need to be thinking differently about service. If that's where he was, if that's the kind of thoughts he had, I just want to be an under rower. Folks, that's something. That's powerful stuff for a Christian to consider that in my journey, well, when I get way up there and I'm more holy than ever and more Christ-like than ever and all that, I just want to be an under rower. Let me tell you a personal story here that will maybe illustrate. Some of you have attended the women's conference that we have back in Wichita. Been going on for 10 years now. Just had the 10th one last month. Uh, about 1,500 women in that picture that attended this year. Uh, our women at Northside put it on, and I, I couldn't tell you how many work at it. I don't think I could count them. Uh, 150 at least, probably close to 200 do something at least during the conference or for the conference. Uh, the way the conference is organized and the way it operates, it's a little bit like a warship. You've got quite a crew. Uh, there are four captains, if you will, four women that are the management team, we call them, and two of them come on every year and two of them go off every two years, so we've always got a rotation there. And they're responsible for the conference, for everything. They're responsible for where it is and who we have speak and uh, how it's organized and what the theme is and how much money is spent on it and how much to charge for tickets. And they're responsible for it. It's a huge responsibility. Absolutely huge commitment of time and stress and the people problems and everything that involved in putting on such a huge event. It's a big deal. Uh, those four, and for that matter, all the other volunteers that run it, are never mentioned. We don't put their picture in the program. Uh, they're not introduced to the crowd. Uh, we really don't even mention them to the congregation. We recognize the workers after conference, but we really don't mention any specifically. And we do that on purpose because we've evolved kind of a mentality around Northside where we think this word under rower is kind of special. Now, I wouldn't say there's nothing been done for those ladies. There's been 17 of those management team ladies that have gone through that huge responsibility experience. Those 17 ladies have received something. We give them a little necklace that's an oar. A little necklace that looks like an oar bit into a heart. And that's our little secret. They're under rowers. That's what we think of them. 
And that's what we want them to think of themselves. They do a really, really big job. But they're just under rowers. None of those 1,500 women know anything about them, but without them, the conference couldn't go on. If anyone asks them what that strange little necklace is, they can say, I'm just an under rower. I think that's a good way for a Christian to think about themselves. Remember last week, Paul's desire? Paul said, I want to know Christ. With all the other things that Paul had going on in his life, he said, I want to know Christ. I want to be more like him. I want to be more and more like him. How many times do you think Paul probably thought of the story in John 13 about Jesus washing the apostles' feet? That's a certain fact. Jesus himself said, I am here as one who serves. This is the creator of the universe. And what are you doing on earth, Jesus? Oh, I just came to serve. I'm just here as one who serves. If Paul thought that way, if Jesus thought that way, let me suggest that if you've been a Christian very long, you ought to think that way. You ought, you ought to begin to think about this place as being a place to serve. You ought to begin to think about home and work and school and every place else that you have influence as I'm just here as one who serves. Uh, that's a step on the journey in a Christian life. Just to give you something to think about. Let me throw these up there and let's talk real quickly through them. Uh, some people, when they say service, they think, well, I, I don't have any talents and I don't know where I can serve and everybody there at church seems to take care of everything. I don't know what I could do. Just think about that for a little while. We usually think about the public areas of service, the guy that preaches, the guy that leads the songs, the uh, secretary that everybody knows, she takes care of things. There's some public roles. There are not many, very many of those. All the other roles are unknown. We, we don't know who does a lot of them. I imagine when you have a funeral here, somebody provides a funeral meal. You name the people that do that. I mean, just start thinking of those kind of things that have to happen in the family life of a church. There's people that are unknown. There was a fellow at Northside died not too long ago, actually. And nobody really looking at him would know that he did anything. He just came in and sat in his seat. But since I knew about my dad living alone and not being able to shovel his driveway, I knew that every time it snowed, that gentleman was over there shoveling his driveway. I'm just here as one who serves. There's a lot of public stuff, but there's a whole lot of unknown stuff. You know, the old picture of the iceberg, the, the public part is just the tip of the iceberg. For, for a family to function and for a body of Christ to function in the community, which we'll talk about next week, people got to serve. You know, if I got up here this morning and my voice went away, I lost it for some reason, I couldn't do this sermon. You know, there's other folks here that could do that. Somebody could say, Bill, or whoever, would you come up and give us a little lesson? Well, yeah, they'd be glad to. We'd get along just fine. But if all the unknowns didn't perform today, then we couldn't have church. You know, somebody paid the electric bill. You know, somebody got communion ready. Somebody got these sermon slides and song slides and organized the service. And somebody did all of these things behind the scenes unknown. There's large jobs and small jobs. There's some really big servant jobs. Running the women's conference is a big deal. Running the family camp here at Castle Rock is a big deal. Running the LTC program, it's a major league project. H having all the Sunday school classes organized and ready and ready for the kids and uh, the adult education, there's a lot of large jobs, but there's a whole lot of small ones that we don't 
don't think about very often. Last week I got here a little bit early and there was snow on the ground. And there's a couple of guys out there shoveling snow. I bet 98% of you don't know who they were. It's unknown and pretty small job, but necessary. There's organized service and there's spontaneous service. Next Saturday, I understand you're having a senior banquet. I bet somebody's organized that pretty well. I bet somebody spent a lot of time on that and got other people to help, and everybody knows what their role is, and it's going to go off like clockwork and all that. The children's classes this morning were organized and ready, and the activities were prepared and all that. But there's a whole lot of spontaneous service, too. I've been to some house-to-house -house meetings since I've been here, and after the meal and all that, I don't think anybody's assigned to clean up, but all of a sudden people just jump up and start cleaning the table and taking things to the kitchen and rearranging things. I don't think anybody asks them to. I don't think it's organized. It's just a spontaneous service. There's that kind of service. There's teams that serve, and there's some individuals that serve. Uh, I know you've got some ministries here that have big organizations. We've got one back home called Ambassadors that they, they visit all the guests and in, uh, shut-ins and other folks. That, that's quite an organization. That's quite a team. And it's broken down into smaller teams, and those teams do what they're supposed to do, and the team leader tells them what they're supposed to do and all that. But then there's a whole lot of individuals that just do their thing. we got one guy, you can't beat him to the hospital. Somebody's sick and in there, I, I try to get there as quick as I can, but I can't beat him. He retired guy, that's just what he does. It's just his service. We got a guy that makes recordings of the sermons and the services and has them available. You can get anyone you want. I had a guy that would get a van that had a retired guy that he'd just show up about every month, and come in, get the key, say, I'm here to check the van out. He'd go gas it up and oil it up and check the tires and do all the stuff. Nobody knew he did that. He didn't need a team to do that. He just did it. There, some service takes a supervisor. And then some all service takes some doers. Somebody's got to organize the Sunday school service or a program and recruit teachers and all that, but somebody just needs to do the job. There's some very sensitive, responsible services, and there's some that aren't so critical. There's some that deal with people's finances and people's personal life and people's marriages and their personal problems and all that. There's those kind of services. It's one thing deacons do. That's why the, Paul said the requirements for a deacon is that they've got to be trustworthy. They've got to be faithful. They've got to be able to keep a confidence. And then he added, and their wives have to, too, because you're dealing with sensitive stuff. But then there's some that aren't so critical. We had a guy not, well, a couple of years ago probably decided, you know, it'd be neat if we had valet parking here. We never thought of valet parking at church. But this young guy didn't have any other jobs to do, and wasn't a real people person and wasn't real talented publicly on the stage or anything. He said, I can park cars. And he recruited some other guys like him, and they get there early and put their little sign out that says valet parking available. Our older citizens, our widows especially, I think that's the greatest service anybody invented in the history of the world. They pull up under the covered and walk away and turn their keys over and their car's waiting for them when they go out. Yeah, just service. I'm just here as one who serves. Now, I, I don't give you that list to be comprehensive or anything else. I'd give it to you for two reasons. Number one, if you're sitting there thinking, I don't know what I can do. I can't serve anyway. I hope that spurred some things in your mind. Yeah, there's a lot of ways to serve. And the second thing I'd think you could do with that, take that list home and think about it. Try to fill it in. If you try to fill in people that are doing some of those things, you'll get a lot more appreciative 
of the service that happens around here. So think about those things. All right, one last verse and we'll close. <clears throat> At the end of most of Paul's letters, he had mentioned some specific people. In, when he wrote to the Colossians in the fourth chapter, he named a lot of people. He talked about the fellows that were traveling with him and the ones he had sent back to bring the letter to the church in Colossae and all that. And one of the ones he mentioned was Epaphras. Epaphras was traveling with Paul, evidently. And he said, Epaphras, who is one of you? He came from Colossae. He said, he's one of you, and he's a servant of Jesus Christ. That was a big commendation from Paul. He said, Epaphras, he's just a servant. So let me ask you, if Paul wrote one more letter, if he wrote the letter to Castle Rock, when he closed it out, could he fill your name in there? Could he write your name in and say, he's one of you, and he's just a servant of Jesus Christ. Paul considered that the highest praise a Christian could have, just being a servant just being an under rower. If you ask the apostle, well, next week we're going to talk about uh, moving from inside to outside. Let me give you a brief preview there. Moving from inside to outside, and we'll consider that next week. Now, I got thinking about this series and how we might understand it or misunderstand it. We've been talking about Paul every week as an example. If you ask Paul, Paul, are you pursuing holiness? He'd say, oh, yeah. Yeah. Every day, every moment, every second I can. He said, in fact, I'm trying to get every thought captive for Christ. That's good, Paul. Paul, are you serving? He said, oh, yeah. I say you serve every day I can. I serve every way I can. I serve every body I can. Okay, Paul, you're working on holiness. You're working on serving. That's what I've been talking about. Do, do you think that if you get holy enough and if you get serve hard enough that you'll get to heaven someday? You know how Paul would answer that? He'd say, oh, no, 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 you're so confused. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. It's his oath, his covenant, his blood that support me. And when he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. If you're not in him this morning, no amount of holiness or service or anything else you can do can justify you before God. It's about moving from death to life. If you need to make that move this morning, we invite you to do so. If you have any other public need, why don't you come? Let's stand and sing this song. Come if you need to.